Dr. Greg Forbes. He is a professor here at GRCC in the biology department and has been for 30 years. He got his BS in wildlife natural resources management from uh, California Polytechnic University, MS in biological sciences from uh, California Polytechnic as well, PhD from the Department of Zoology and the Department of Tropical Environmental Studies at James Cook University in Australia. He is also a certified wildlife biologist. His areas of expertise are organismal biology, evolutionary biology, human anatomy, and physiology. And besides these, he's also taught courses in zoology, natural resources management, geology, tropical ecology, and marine biology. He has studied, taught, and led expeditions in numerous countries all over the world, and you would probably hear nothing but me tonight if I had to go through that long list. Uh, awards he's received are the College Science Teacher of the Year by the Michigan Teachers Association, the Civil, Civil Libertarian of the Year by the ACLU, and the Free Thinker of the Year by the Free Thought Association. He's also been the past education director for the Michigan Evolutionary, Evolution Education Initiative, the past director of the National Institute for Evolution Education, and the past director of the National Science Foundation's course on evolution and evolution education, which is for college and university professors. He's also been on the editorial board of Skeptic Magazine for 30 years. And lastly, in his free time, he loves flying a plane, whitewater paddling, and doing some biking. So with all that, please help me welcome Dr. Greg Forbes and the growth of pseudoscience, what is going on? Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Emmanuel, how are we doing on audio in the back? Excellent. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I ordered spring for you especially, so you don't have to fight the snow and the sleet and the hail and everything else. So welcome to this evening. And if you don't know, I'm a walker. I know I'm supposed to stay over there behind the podium the whole time, but I'm going to come and invade your privacy during the entire meeting tonight. So thank you for coming for the to discuss this really important topic on pseudoscience. Because what we're seeing here is an increase in the beliefs in unscientifically validated belief systems in the United States and in fact the world. And the question is, well, why is that when in fact access to true science is more readily available than it has ever been during our lifetime? So you think that curve would be going the opposite way compared to what we see. So more about that in just a minute. But we want to say happy birthday to Chuck, okay? Because that's why we're here celebrating Darwin's birthday. We're looking at Darwin right now, if he were still with us, would be a mere 215 years old. And the question is, what would he think about where we are in society today? He was part of the Victorian science explosion that took interest in science and specialization in science to a place we'd never seen it until his time. So if he were to come back and visit us today, would he be happy with where we are, what the trajectory is? I wish we could ask him, but unfortunately we can't. So what are we gonna be looking at tonight? Here's where we're going to be going tonight. First of all, we're going to be looking here at framing the discussion so we can understand kind of the topic we're discussing and the parameters of it. We'll be looking at what is pseudoscience. We have to define that. Then we'll look at origins of belief systems because if we're talking about the field of science, we recognize that very few people think scientifically. What are the other ways of knowing? What are the other basis of belief systems? And then we'll take a look at what is science, because if we're talking about what isn't science, we clearly have to know what is science. Then the discussion, where do we stand in our science literacy? How are we doing as a society? How are we doing as a country? And are we really fostering understanding of science? And then we'll take a look here at pseudoscience beliefs in the United States. And this is a sampling. I say it's a sampling because we could go on for hours and hours and hours. And at the end, I will give you two great references if you want to take a deep dive into this. So this is kind of the Whitman sampler to wet your whistle and get your interest in this topic. In fact, I always have when I do my presentations, there are more slides at the end of my presentation that are included because there's basically the editorial room cuts that had to come out because there were so many fun things that we could have talked about, but of course we have limited time. Then we'll take a look at contributing factors. How did we get here? What's maybe going wrong in our society? What are the trajectories that are taking down this road of being a less scientifically literate 
society. And then we'll take a look at, well, what does the future hold? Okay, where do we go from here? So let's take a look here. What is pseudoscience? We're going to define for tonight's presentation pseudoscience as being a statement, a belief, or a practice that claims to be both scientific and factual, but are incompatible or have not been validated by the scientific method. Now, there are multiple articles from scientists saying stop using the term pseudoscience, but that's in the context of what we call emerging sciences, because we have sciences that are not yet validated by hard data, but it's looking pretty good, right? We're saying that this could be something that we validate in the future, and those are called emerging sciences, and we want to give them the credence and the respect that they deserve. And we don't want to define them as being pseudoscientific. Tonight we're talking about just crazy ideas that have had no realm of scientific success in substantiating their claims at all. So I'm comfortable using this term, and it's a well-used term in the literature. So let's take a look here at how we arrived at our belief systems, because I've spent my lifetime in science and as a science educator also for a major portion of that, trying to get students to understand the what is science and more importantly, what's the nature of science, right? But that's not how we all look at life. It's not the lens we all look through. So what are some different avenues by which people arrive at their belief systems? And one of them is innate, right? Just this inner feeling that it has to be so. How many times have you thought or said, it's just, I have this gut feeling, right? I just, I just know this is right. And I, I just, I feel this is the way to do it. And a lot of people run all of their decisions in that manner, okay, without a doubt. For instance, let's take a look at the lottery, okay? Now, this is time to fess up and we won't judge you, but who plays, who has played the lottery in here? Come on, come on, don't make me come to your house. Okay, sir, how did you choose your numbers? Um, computer pick. Computer pick, oh, you just said, give me the quick pick. Anybody else take another route? What was yours? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, okay. You're ahead of me here, okay? So how about birthdays? Anybody choose birthdays? Yeah, birthdays, anniversary dates? Yeah, we all have a little formula, don't we? But as you know, what if I were to give you a million dollars and say, go ahead and choose those six numbers? And many of you will come up this magic way. In fact, the guy who won the Powerball in DC Last January, $320 million that he won, until they told him he didn't, by choosing the birth dates of all of his family members. Afterwards, they said, just kidding, those weren't the numbers we meant. Swear to God, it's in court right now. Went to court today. But would you choose these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six? You know, come on. What are the odds? What are the, a savant, a savant, OK? <laughs> you know, what are the chances of it really being one, two, three, four, five, six? the exact same odds as any other combination you come up with. But somehow you go, I just don't feel that that's right. Just, innately, that, that can't be so. Trust me, look at this face. This is my honest face. It's so. It's the exact same probability. But you say, well, I have another way of approaching life. Right? I, just, I just went with my gut feeling. And that's great. If it gets you through the day, run with it. But it falls outside the purview of the scientific approach to the world. Another thing that people look at is a revelation or an epiphany, right? The sudden awakening to the truth. You say, my life was going in this trajectory until one day I had an epiphany. Now, sometimes that's wearing a toga, drinking yak fat in Nepal. Sometimes it's pulling on your underwear in the locker room at the YMCA, right? But all of a sudden, life is perfectly clear and you change the trajectory of your life. And that's great if it gets you through the day, it's great if you run your life that way, but it again, it falls outside the purview of a scientific lens by which we view the world. How about mysticism, paranormal, okay? So if you're into new age stuff, how about consulting your crystals for your investments? How about looking at your Ouija board? Many people in this group grew up with Ouija boards. Who's had their hand on a Ouija board? There you go, okay? Now, you know, now, most of you weren't making financial investments and personal decisions by that Ouija board. It was fun. You know, astrologers, palmistry, you name it. And this, again, a lot of people run their lives this way. My wife and I are spending next week in Sedona, Arizona, so we're going to be in the thick of it, okay? And this is kind of like the new age capital of North America. A lot of crystals there. And a lot of people say, I'm comfortable with that. Mysticism, paranormal, we can't know it all, and that's how I run my life, that's how I make my decisions. And again, if it works for you, run with it, but it falls outside the purview of science. How about dogmatism? 
Okay? Dogmatism. Judging your decisions based upon the assumed authority of some person or some institution. Some person tells you this is how you should think, this is what you should believe, this is how you should behave, and a big chunk of the world says, I'm good with that, okay? Why bother myself with having to determine my own behaviors? I'd rather be told how to behave or how to think. And, you know, science, not science, but education isn't immune to this. I know there are a lot of teachers in the room here. Who are teachers and retired teachers in here? So, have you all heard about the learning pyramid, right? We say, in our teacher classes, we, you know, we make you get a tattoo with the learning pyramid and we say, this is how students learn. That if you, if you just have them read it, they'll remember 10% of it. If they demonstrate it to themselves and others, 30%. If they practice doing it, 75%. And if they teach others, they'll learn 90% of it. Research was never done. This first came out in an, an owner's manual for audiovisual equipment in 1954. And then it was adopted by the National Training Laboratories, which for a period of about five years, I was working with them to try and find the research that they claimed they had. And now their official response is, it's been lost. It was never done, right? Okay, and always be suspicious when the numbers are nice and clean like that. But it's dogma, right? And we teach it to our teachers as if this is really true. It's a dogmatic belief because somebody told you that you trust it. Okay. Empiricism, knowledge gained through experience. Mother tells you, honey, don't touch the stove. The stove is hot. And so you trust her because this is mom, okay? Because mom has told some good calls. Don't play on the freeway, right? Don't, don't harass a shark. These were all good calls. But then life goes on. You recognize mom lied a little bit about Christmas. The whole Easter bunny laying eggs thing, pfft, didn't go. Tooth fairy, pfft, that was ridiculous. Leprechauns and the rainbows, mom and mom's stories haven't panned out. So now you're thinking, maybe she lied to me about the stove also. So you toddle in there and you reach up and go, ja! okay? No longer a dogmatic belief, right? Just elevated to what? An empirical belief, right? Because you've practiced and you've found out that, in fact, you've tested that dogma. This is, in fact, what we see where science operates. Science operates in the realm of empiricism, not by just touching stoves. It's a little more detailed than that. But if we look collectively on how people arrive at their belief systems or their understanding of the world around us, we have innate that we've talked about, revelation epiphanies, mysticism, paranormal, dogmatism, and empiricism, which is the realm of science that we're talking about tonight, right? Because somebody said it's true, we don't believe it. Because it might be true, we don't believe it. Can we empirically demonstrate that it is true? That falls within that body of knowledge we know as science. If not, maybe we sequester it to an emerging science, you know, data to be determined later on. We're all, in, all on board with black holes, aren't we, right now? Okay, okay, 15 years ago, you know, it was a couple pints of beer and a couple good discussions saying, I wonder if these things exist. It was an emerging science back then. Now we understand they exist, they're real. So what is science as a body of knowledge? Because when we talk about science, it's two things. It's a process, you know, it's a scientific method. We don't have time tonight to, to talk about that. And not all science works by every single aspect of the scientific method like we teach it in school. The reality is, okay, one of my doctors was working on sea turtles in Australia, okay, in the Great Barrier Reef. As much as I would get them to try and behave the way I wanted them to, they just wouldn't listen. I had no controls, right? You get the best controls that you can. But when we follow that scientific method the best we can, we arrive at a body of knowledge called science. So we think of science as being a process and also a body of knowledge. But when you say, you know, what is science and what is this body of knowledge? Actually, we use in a lot of our textbooks the decision of what is science from a judge, okay? A judge in 1982 in a classic case on evolutionary science, McLean versus Arkansas Board of Education. There were 22 Nobel Prize laureates that filed amicus briefs to the court on what they believe science to be. Because in this case, they were trying to introduce intelligent design creation science. They said, well, well science? OK, well, well, no, not by the following criteria. And so the judge says, let me see if I understand what all you 20 Nobel Prize laureates are telling me. You're saying that science is guided by natural law. Yes, not supernatural intervention, not wishes, not hopes, but by natural law. And if, in fact, it's guided by natural law, Science has to explain what is observed 
with reference to that natural law, the laws of chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics. So for instance, when your little child looks up and says, Mommy, Daddy, can you please tell me about lightning and thunder? If you conjure up images of angels bowling in the clouds making thunder, that's not a scientific explanation. But if you talk about the fact that you have positively charged regions of the cloud, negatively charged, and when these ions come together, sparks will literally fly. You're making reference to laws of physics at that point. That's a scientific explanation. When we talk about rainbows, mommy, daddy, where do rainbows come from? Again, if you conjure up images of leprechauns and good luck, that's not a scientific explanation. But if you talk about white light being fractioned and separated by the water droplets and talk about Tyndall scattering, again, you're describing how these things work with reference to natural law, not conjuring up some mythical you know, endeavor. Science also has to be testable against the natural world. This is important, because when people make pseudoscientific claims, they say, well, just, just trust me. I mean, I know it's true. I, I've heard it three times, OK? Therefore, if you've heard it three times, it must be true, OK? Well, no, it has to be testable. Let me give you an example of that. People say, because as was mentioned in the introduction, and thank you for that introduction, is that I spent a big chunk of my career um, teaching K-12 teachers how to teach evolution and the nature of science. And immediately, people feel a challenge to their religious beliefs. And you say, oh, you scientists are just trying to disprove God, that there's a God, you know, be it your God or the other 2,500 described in human society. And you say, well, no, because the presence or absence of a God is not a hypothesis that we can test, right? So it falls outside the purview of science. Science can't test for the presence or absence of a God. It's untestable. Go ahead, come up with an experiment, all right? So that doesn't fall in the purview of science. But can we test, for instance, the hypothesis, which has to be testable by definition, a hypothetical hypothesis is a testable statement about the natural world. Can we test the hypothesis that fishes evolved before amphibians? Yes, we can go to the geologic strata anywhere on this planet, and we never see a little amphibian that snuck in the fossil record before the fishes because fishes gave rise to amphibians. So the hypothesis that fishes gave rise to amphibians is testable against the natural world. Is astrology? Well, no, OK? Are horoscopes? Well, no, they fail this test. Science has conclusions that are tentative, pending a contradictory information, pending information to the opposite. My students always struggle with this. They say, let me get this right, Dr. Forbes. So you're telling me that science is telling it so until you tell me it's not. Yes, and that's one of the beautiful things about science, right? We're willing to say, we now have new data. And based upon the new data, we're re-examining our, our approach to this and seeing with the new data, maybe we didn't have it exactly quite right. But here's what I want to tell you. Never in the history of science has a scientific theory been crumbled down because of new data. Quite the opposite. Let's take a look at atomic theory. The Bohr model suggests that electrons, you were all taught this, electrons move in predictable orbits. Nonsense, OK? No, that's not true, OK? Does that mean that atomic theory came crashing down? No, it made it stronger. It makes more sense. It's more predictable. Now we understand that part was wrong. How about cell membranes? We used to teach you that cell membranes were rigid structures. Wrong, OK? Turns out the molecules are moving all over like balls in a swimming pool. Does that destroy cell theory? No, it makes it stronger. It's more predictable. We just cleaned it up a little bit. How about plate tectonics? Prior to 1969, we said the Earth has what? A static crust. Yeah, evidence to the contrary all around us. And then Alfred Wegener comes around and goes, you know, I think I have a different idea. There are these 12 big plates like peels on an orange. You go, yeah, sure, emerging science. And that was it in 1969. But now we know. Okay, so we've changed that geo geocentric theory, or that geo theory. On the right-hand side, also, someone was talking to me ahead of time saying, I under just heard something on NPR that we're seeing more and more scientific theories, or research papers, rather, that are being recalled because they're not quite, you know, not quite accurate. The good news is, you know who's recalling them? Not the journalists, not the politicians, it's who? It's the scientists. People think that science is a kind, benevolent, humanistic endeavor. It's like every other human endeavor. 
it's like piranha, okay? Is that everybody wants to be he or she that publishes first and get the data. And it's a really high bar to get material published. One of the classics here, you may remember at Dawson here, who came down with Piltdown Men, back, you know, Piltdown Men? And you know, this missing link turned out that he faked it. It was the mandible from an orangutan and a human skull. Made him famous in the short term, but who determined the fraud? Science, because science is self correcting. Okay? And that's what's so wonderful about it. So what science is the body of knowledge? Guided by natural law. <clears throat> Must explain what it's observed with reference to those natural laws. Has conclusions that are tentative, pending addition, additional information to the contrary. And isn't that the case with diet information and heart health information and how much you should exercise? The more data we get, we get closer to the absolute facts. What's pseudoscience? Statements, beliefs, or practices that claim to be meeting these criteria, but are incompatible either with the scientific method to test for the presence or absence of a god, falls outside the purview of science. That's not something that science can address. We leave that one to the philosophers. We leave that one to the theologians. So pseudoscientific beliefs of the US, again, just a sampling. I could go on for days about this, and I love to. I was like, you're not going to believe this. And I have family members who have many of these belief systems. So I'm quiet a lot at family events. Let's take a look here. Four in 10 Americans believe in ghosts and demons. Okay? So how many believe in demons? 45%. So if we were a sampling, it'd be everybody on this side of the room because it's almost 50%. 45% believe in demons. There's a classic Carl Sagan book, which I'll talk about at the end, called what? Demon Haunted world. What a scary place to believe, to live, if you think that there are demons haunting your every move. How about ghosts? 45 percent. And this is no different in my science classrooms. I recognize this is who's sitting in my classroom the first day that I have to say, let's look at another lens. Let's look at this differently. Vampires, likely only 13 percent. Even after the Twilight trilogy, we're still down at 13 percent. So it's safe. You probably won't get your blood sucked. But how about other miscellaneous supernatural beings? 46%, basically half of the US population. And you wonder why pseudoscience believes receive a welcome, open-armed opportunity, especially when people are trying to make money off it. Amer American adult belief in conspiracy theories. OK, so Bigfoot is real. There's something funky on the graphics here from the publisher. Bigfoot is real, 13%. OK, so 13% that Bigfoot is real. Look up here at aliens have visited humans on Earth. So up here at the top, you know, right up here, 31 percent, almost one out of three. Now, I'm not poo-pooing the fact that there's life out there. We know there's going to be life out in the universe. Since the late 70s, NASA has had the, set, the, uh, the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they're looking for not just life, they're looking for intelligent life. You know, I tell my students, I think, wait a minute, you're saying that there's life on other planets, but you think we're the only game in town? that we're the only planet in our solar system that got it right of the hundreds of billions of solar systems, of the billions of galaxies in our universe. We're the only star that's exactly the correct distance from the sun. Statistically impossible, right? So we know that there are going to be other life forms. The question is, have they visited us? You know, have they been here? And then take a look here at the Loch Ness Monster. You're looking at 8 or 9%. So you know, Bigfoot is that one that we can actually continue with here, because it's Bigfoot, OK? Take a look at this. By the way, you'll see QR codes down here. You can scan these with your phone to take you to the actual research. So if you want to go to any of these articles, you can just scan that. And this will be on video also, so it'll take you directly to the, the research. So American adults' belief in Bigfoot, or if you prefer, Sasquatch or Yeti or whatever your particular colloquialism might be, 15% in the West. 13% here in the Midwest, so pretty uniform, right? Pretty uniform you know, in the, in the mid-teens. But you think, well, that's only children believe in that. Look on the right-hand side, OK? Uh, American adult believe, oh, this is by urbanicity. I have another one for you. So you can see that whether you're urban, whether you're suburban, or whether you're rural, your belief systems are pretty much the same there. But take a look here. Here's by age, OK? So it's not just the kids that believe in Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti. It's pretty much uniform, except for those darn millennials in the middle there. We're going to come back and talk about millennials. They, they're at the top of the graphs on everything we're talking about tonight, OK? So now, Bigfoot, you know, we can say, well, you know, how do you know there isn't a Bigfoot? Well, 
Actually, I live in the eastern side of the county, and my wife and I live on forested property. We have ponds, we have streams, and we have forest. And we, on more than one occasion, have seen Bigfoot. Okay, okay. Even my granddaughter has seen Bigfoot, okay? Regularly back there. Every time we go back to the forest there, I wish there was Bigfoot, okay? Look at this. One in 25% of the U.S. population, okay, reported using ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19. Now, if you're not familiar with these drugs, let's just do ivermectin. Ivermectin is used to treat nematode parasites, roundworm parasites. That's what it's developed for. That's what it's licensed for. It has shown zero efficacy in fighting COVID, okay? None at all. But one in 20 people, okay, 5% have taken it. I have family members that have taken ivermectin. Look down here. It says, this is from um, JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. People who endorsed even just one piece of misinformation about vaccines had significantly greater likelihood of turning to unproven treatments, other unproven treatments, because if you've swallowed you know, one of these, you're willing to do more. Or those who reported they trusted social media. So how many of us would report that we trust social media? Okay. Or scored high on the American conspiracy thinking scale. There's a scale for this. You can see how you place. Or those who said they trusted former President Trump. We're not bashing Trump here. That, that's low-hanging fruit. Okay? What we're going to do here is show that, that pseudoscience beliefs usually, uh, when we look at partisan divides, climate and energy, strong partisan divides. Okay? But in the rest of pseudoscience beliefs, it's really not partisan driven, except we're going to see a couple tonight where we do see some of those. Take a look here. Percent who agree are unsure or disagree with three conspiracy claims. So vaccinations implant a microchip. So we have, if you take a look here, 29% of the US population, a little under a third that said, yeah, I didn't get a vaccine because I don't want Bill Gates following me around. Okay, there are microchips. I also have family members who didn't get them because of the microchip scare. If we look at Earth is flat, not round. Look at this, 19%. 19%, okay, everybody knows it's flat. You can look out at that Lake Michigan, it's flat. You don't see any curves there because they think that necessarily what you see is what is real. And that's not always true, right? Let me check you. Okay, this is in, in education, we always say, give your students low hanging fruit so they get a success and they feel good about participating. So I'm expecting participation, okay? Here's an easy one the sun does what every morning? Does it rise in the east or rise in the west? East, and every night it sets in the west. How are we feeling, pretty good? You're all wrong, you know. Does the sun move at all? No. no. We move, but I see it every day. I, for 50 years I've been watching it do this. Don't tell me I'm wrong. You also think that you have blue blood in your veins, don't you? You don't, okay? So this is terrible because you see it doesn't mean it's necessarily true. Take a look here, NASA didn't land on the moon. Almost 30% think that that was faked. Earth is billions of years old. The good news is 75% said yes, and that's the correct answer, okay? 25% said, no, 10,000 feels better. And in case you are wondering whether people still believe this, you still have a chance to join the Flat Earth Society, okay? Which has been around for almost 30 years now in Lancaster, California, right on the San Andreas Fault. You think they'd be believers, okay? It says the Flat Earth Society mans its guns against oppression of thought and the globalist lies of a new age. Standing with reason, we offer a home to those wayward thinkers that march bravely on with reason and truth in recognition of the true shape of the Earth, flat, okay? So you can join if you want. They probably have T-shirts for you, okay? Take a look at this, okay? We look at the population here. How many believe in spiritual energy can be located in physical things? So quartz crystals, for instance, may have power. They may have energy. And we're looking here based upon education. Let's look at the education. We can see for each of these beliefs, second column, beliefs in psychics, belief in reincarnation, belief in astrology. Look what happens as we go from high school education level to some college to college graduate, it decreases. And you think, well, that would make sense because they're more highly educated. And that's pretty much what we see, but 
Stay tuned. Percent who agree with various conspiracy or scientific statements. So vac vaccinations, implant microchips. So 9% say, yep, I'm on board with that. The Earth is flat, 10%. This is a different study, different university. Uh, moon landings are fake, 12%. COVID risks are exaggerated. All those people didn't really die. Okay, humans evolved. 58% said, I'm on board with that, which means, of course, that 42% said no, right? If you take a look down here, is that humans changed the climate. 64% said, yeah, why 36 said mm, no, okay? Vaccines mostly beneficial, 69%, while of course 31% said no. Earth is billions of years old, 75% said yes, 25% said eh, eh, that's not true. There you go, Earth revolves around the sun. You guys almost just failed that, by the way, okay? But 83% saying, yeah, but 70% said, mm, I don't think that's right, okay? Responses to conspiracy or science statements by whether respondent approves or disapproves of Donald Trump. Again, this isn't about Donald Trump. It's showing that we're seeing partisan divides in beliefs in all pseudoscience, not just energy and climate. So if we look here at the first question, the first question here is on vaccinations. So we want to look at the blue and the orange together. Those that agree or aren't willing to say no. So those that approved of his presidency, almost 40% said yeah, vaccines and plant a microchip. Those that didn't approve his presidency said, 15% said, uh, yeah, I think that vaccines and plant a microchip. Across all these questions, Earth is flat, NASA didn't land on the moon, whoa, whoa. And then down here, the Earth is billions of years old. You can see that people who were in the Trump camp were more likely to believe pseudoscientific beliefs than pretty much anything, okay? And so again, this is what we're starting to see is a partisan divide in pseudoscience other than just energy and climate. If we look at the generations, okay, is one generation more likely to hold these pseudoscientific beliefs? And as I had to do, I had to look up all the generations, so I put a cheat sheet for us over here on the side, okay? So here we have uh, early boomers, late boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. So the same questions, vaccinations, Earth is flat, landing on the moon, Earth is billions of years old. So you can see if we add up again, the blue and the orange, those darn millennials right here, okay? Vaccines and plant microchips. Earth is flat, not round. NASA did not land in the moon, okay? Actually, this is the only one that they weren't uh, number one in. And then down here, Earth is billions of years old. They were one of the slower groups there. So we're seeing that, that we actually have generational differences also, as would be expected, okay? Let's take a look here at, you know, we could continue on with hours and hours of these pseudoscientific beliefs. This is a sampler, right, of, of where we are. It gives you a lot of different information. Let's instead take a look here at influences. Why is it that we have so many people believing pseudoscientific beliefs? What's going on in our society? What can we change? What can we look at to see what's going on? So when we take a look here at where people are in this scale, okay, we have to kind of look at the gullibility continuum here, is that you don't want to be completely credulous where you believe everything that you're told, right? Little children do that till they're about two, right? And then they start to question everything. Why can't I have candy? I didn't have candy yesterday. You don't want to be incredulous on the other end, being a skeptic about anything on the planet. You get nowhere at that point. Science falls, what, somewhere here in this green zone, right in the middle, because the more people tell me about amazing things, we recognize, look what we've all seen in our lifetime in science. I mean, this is the century of biology right now. This is the century of biology. And so every day you pick up the newspaper, these things we used to print on, on paper, and you look at your, your feed, it's astounding what we're able to do now. And 10 years ago, you get, ah, we're never going to be able to, look at AI. I mean, you know, AI, I mean, who would have thought, you know, just a couple of years ago. And so, uh, when was, I hear amazing claims, you know, there's a, a statement that says, you know, incredible claims require incredible data, you know, paraphrasing that. And it really, you say, the claim that you're making is really hard for me to accept. So you say, I'm initially skeptical. That's different than saying it's pseudoscience, right? You're saying, I'm initially skeptical based upon what I know about science and the world around us, but I'm willing to entertain 
any data that you may have, right? You don't want to go the other end and go, nope, it's not in my dogma, right? So I'm not going to listen to it. You also don't want to go this end and go, sure, tell me what to believe, right? You want to be somewhere here in the middle and recognize that we're willing to hear those claims, but we also have to be able to test those. Remember those rules of science. So let's take a look here. Now, science can be very hard to understand. I've spent most of my professional career teaching college and university science classes, trying to get students to understand nature of science and, and content. Contents, that's really, really challenging for students. We know STEM classes in general, science, technology, engineering, math, are the great feared classes. I teach now anatomy and physiology, which are considered to be probably the hardest courses that you have on campus, besides maybe advanced calculus and advanced physics. And so it's not pretty, OK? So we're trying to get the content down is a really big challenge, because it's really hard to learn science. It's a different way of knowing. But the fact that you don't understand science doesn't mean that it's not true, right? Neil deGrasse Tyson, this is one of his quotes. He now has t-shirts, apparently. Your inability to grasp science is not a valid argument against it, right? And so we have to understand that because a person doesn't understand it, and they may say, I'm not going to accept it, that's really not the correct protocol. We have to, especially as science educators, try and help our students understand what's going on. So let's take a look at influences and the acceptance of pseudoscience beliefs. You know, why are we here having this conversation? What's going on in our society? Let's take a look at literacy levels. Okay. What are the literacy levels? Reading in general. Because in order to wrap your arms around an emerging science, a scientific body of knowledge, one of the prerequisites is your ability to what? To read, right? Your ability to read. Okay. Overall academic achievement. Not only reading, but what is the highest academic achievement that you've attained to help you understand these very complex um, uh, ideas in science? And then science literacy. What's your background in science? Before we can tell you about AI technology, before we can tell you about black holes, before we can tell you about cloning, before we can tell you about CRISPR technology and genetics, you have to have some science under your belt. Education and income level, are they going to affect our science literacy? Well, sure, because they affect our access to education, et cetera. Paradigm stasis okay, is that we get these opinions, and we're quite happy holding on to those opinions. right? Don't make me change my mind. And then we'll take a look at confirmation bias and social media algorithms. Are they having any influence upon our dogmatic beliefs? And then misunderstanding the process and nature of science and misunderstanding some basic scientific terminology. And then also confusing anecdotal experiences with scientific data. And then finally, confusing correlation and causation. People think they're the same thing. So let's take a look at literacy rate influence. So US literacy levels. <clears throat> so this is a national literacy study that happens every year by the same organization. And the numbers that we see right here are levels of literacy. They're defined over here. They actually don't have a, a, a level zero, but I put one in for it. This is level zero over here. So level zero is non-literate. So the old term is illiterate, right? The inability to read. Can't grasp science and scientific information if you can't read. Look at level one. 14% of the US population here reads and writes below the basic level. Level two here, another 34% of our population read and, write, read and writes here at the basic level. So, so below basic, I'm sorry, I was number one. And number two is basic. Level three over here, read and write at intermediate level. Level four are proficient. Now, so you don't have to tap your foot and add up the numbers. I did it for you. Half of the US population reads at level two or below, which is read and write at a basic level. They don't assign reading grade levels on their, on their groups here, so I did based upon some other data. Well, this means right here that half of the US population reads at seventh grade and below. Textbooks, you ready for this one? Drum roll. College textbooks are written at what level? Eighth grade. Textbooks at all levels are written never above eighth grade. Graduate school, of course, would be. Newspapers, social feeds, seventh grade level. Okay? So you say, well, we're going to try and talk about CRISPR technology and genetics. Well, if you have a seventh grade literacy level, that's going to be really hard to do. And you're going to be more likely to be subject to pseudoscientific beliefs. 
This same group here, here's the sad news, <laughs> okay? In 2012, this organization, which is a national organization that does these, took out level number five. How come? Because they said too few people in level five to consider. Level five is probably what this learned group is in here, quite seriously, okay? It says, they're able to identify typical tasks, identify from search results, a book suggesting that claims made both for and against genetically modified foods are unreliable. So could you do that with a literature search? And this group, I'm sure, could. But very few people can in the US population, which is why level five isn't even measured anymore. It's the wrong way we're going, don't you think? Okay, let's take a look here at overall academic achievement. How are we doing as far as academic achievement goes in the United States? We're, we tell ourselves all the time that we're the best in everything, right? The US is the best, this and this and this and this. And, and we believe those dogmas. But let's take a look at the data here. The American College Test, ACT and SAT, is given in almost, it's given in all 50 states. And it has a larger administration than the SAT does. And so we tend to use the ACT uh, levels to look at what's the at achievement level of our graduating high school class. And let's take a look here. Now, are the students proficient? ACT here defines proficient as a high probability of success. Students who meet a benchmark, and there are four of them, reading, writing, math, and science. So if you meet that benchmark on the ACT, you have a 50% chance of earning a B in college, in a college course. If you had a if you reach attainment in math, you're 50% likely to be in a math class. If you um, are, are better, or a 75% chance of earning a C or better in corresponding college courses. So let's see. So this is data. Um, last year's data just came out a couple weeks ago. So if we look over here, these numbers over here are the uh, numbers of benchmarks. Remember, there are four benchmarks, English, math, science, and, and reading. So if we take a look here at those students, these are across the United States that were satisfactory, meeting the minimum requirements in all four of those criteria. Look at that, we're below 30%. It's been kind of stable from 2014, but oh, there's a little dip right there. How about those students that met three of the four? Look at that, we're down at about the 12, 13% down here and it's going downhill. How about those that met two of the four? It's in gray, it's hidden back here. Okay, and then let's look at this one here. How many met zero? Didn't meet minimum requirements in all four of those areas? It's going up. So are these students that are gonna be prepared to say, teach me about quantum mechanics? Okay, take a look here. This is the percent of benchmarks met in the mean composite score. If you don't know, because it's probably been a few years, the maximum score in the ACT is 36, okay? So that's this line right here, okay? So of those students that met all four categories, their mean score was about 26 or 27. Those students that failed all categories, their mean score was about 15 out of 36, which is about 40%. And look at that, it's been consistent for the last decade-ish. In fact, it's going down a little bit. So not a good omen for are you going to understand the science. How about science literacy? Well, how did they do in science? Because that's what we're talking about tonight. Okay, we understand, yes, you have to be able to read. You have to understand English. You have to be able to do mathematical computations. But if we're talking about science literacy, what are the literacy rates? Look over here. This is the percent that met the minimum requirement. So if we see here, look at this. We're down now to less than one-third of the students sitting in my classrooms have met the minimum high school standard for science, and their reading level may be at the seventh to eighth grade. Now, granted, the college population is more selective than that, so a lot of these people aren't gonna go to college, so it's actually better than that in our freshman classes, but you can see that we don't have any big outstanding cohorts over this decade. In fact, it's stable or, or getting worse. So these are the people that are very likely to believe all kinds of pseudoscience beliefs because they've demonstrated a lack of understanding of the nature of science and the content of science. Okay, so let's take a look here at the summary from, this is from this year from ACT. ACT scores declined for six consecutive years across all subjects, ready for this? 
even as high school GPAs continue to rise over the same period. <clears throat> we have lower bars for our high school students. We're telling them they're better than they are, and they get to college classes, and they recognize, I'm having a problem here. So GPA is going up, but performance and a test of their knowledge is going down. 40% of seniors met none of the college readiness be benchmarks. They're not ready to discuss science. 70% of seniors fell short of college readiness benchmarks for math. Only 21% met all four benchmarks. One in five people graduating in high school for the last 10 years in the United States passed all four benchmarks. And then we're saying, let's understand advanced science versus just tell me what to think. Okay. Students meeting no benchmarks reach 43%. Current average ACT composite score is 19.5 out of 36. Okay. And again, this is basically across all US states. How about education level and income influence on accepting science, uh, pseudoscience beliefs? This is percentage of US adults who say the following about childhood measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Okay, so is it, is it, does it work? So yeah, their overall judgment, yeah, the benefits outweigh the risks. So of US adults, 88%. But look over here at, at uh, post-grads. Post-grads, 93% said, yeah, the risk absolutely outweigh, uh, excuse me, the benefits outweigh the risk. College grad, bachelor and above, 93, and it goes down. Same thing over here. Uh, preventative health risk, that vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, has preventative value. You can see that it's directly related to educational attainment. So you think, okay, well, more education. Well, we've been giving more education in high schools, but has that been affected by the data I just showed you? No. GPA is going up in high schools nationally. Performance is going down, right? And if we understand data, that's not supposed to work. So, so wait a minute, okay? So if, in fact, education is going to help, and, understand, and rejecting pseudoscientific beliefs, look what happened here. This is a study, a questionnaire that was given to students, graduate students, in a um, program for teacher education. And in this particular cohort, which is amazing, is that 50% of them had graduate courses in chemistry, 19 had graduate courses in engineering, 7% had graduate courses in physics, and 5% had graduate courses in pharmacy, and then so on. So these are people with a lot of science background going into teacher education. They were asked to fill out the survey, and we'll just look at a couple of the questions here. Look on the right-hand side. So here's the percentage that agreed with these questions. In the past, the Earth was visited by extraterrestrials. 10% of those highly educated science people going into education said, yeah, okay. Astrologists claim that the position of celestial bodies at the time of birth determines people's life paths. 14% said, I'm on board with that. And they're gonna be teaching your kids, okay? Humans are not descended from other primates. 11% said, that's correct, okay? Homeopathy is a remedy for some diseases. 51%. Homeopathy is different than holistic medicine, right? They're, they're different. Homeopathy is very different. 51%, did I mention that? 51%, okay? As a component of traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture is an effective remedy for many diseases. 79%. And just as an FYI, there's no empirical data for that. Okay? Uh, some, people cannot com some people can communicate through their minds. 17%. Current climate change is not generated by humans. These are highly educated people going into the teaching profession. And so, is there cause for a little concern? Probably. <laughs> but here's the thing. Okay? The good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe it or understand it or not, right? Because a lot of time we take the intellectual lazy and go, that's really hard to learn about all that stuff. Just tell me what you think, and then I'll believe that also. Back to what? A dogmatic belief. Okay? Paradigm stasis influence. Okay? Paradigm, the tendency to continue to hold on to a belief even when presented with evidence to the contrary, right? It's my belief, it's my paradigm, I'm comfortable with it, Please don't mess with it because it works for me. And this is called paradigm stasis. In fact, I have a whole K-12 presentation in here for teachers on how to, how to teach to paradigm stasis change, right? How do you get your students to take their most fundamental presupposition and entertain the evidence to the contrary? So one of my former uh, colleagues in Skeptic Magazine, <coughs> J. Stewart Nelson, the quote I have from him, 
The most educated, intelligent, and successful adults rarely change their most fundamental presuppositions. And we're all different in here, right? That's not us, right? That is us, right? We'd like to say that we're less subject to that, but we're all subject to this, aren't you? Okay? And here's another from a colleague from Calvin College here, uh, Dr. Howard Van Til, who did these two books, a big history to that. We were driving back from a meeting once in the car, and he said, you know, you can't change somebody's paradigm using logic when they arrived at their paradigm illogically in the first place, right? If you wrapped your arms around a, par uh, around a dogmatic belief, and I'm going to tell you scientifically why that's wrong, I'm using logic, and that's not how you arrived at that. We find out now, the sociologists have showed us, if somebody arrives at a paradigm emotively, how must you talk to them? emotively, right, before you can introduce the, the science. This one I love from Max Planck, uh, famous physicist. Okay? An important scientific innovation rarely makes its way by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. What does happen is that its opponents gradually die out and the growing generation is familiarized with the idea from the beginning. We say the best scientific inventions take place at the gravesite. Okay? And, and this is true of faculty members. I remember the, the brand new faculty, which was just a couple weeks ago. As a brand new faculty member, you're thinking, well, I want to do this. I want to change this. I want to do this way. And then the old gray staff, you know, say, we don't do it that way. You know, we're, you know, we're the most prepared, the most energetic. We go, no, you can't do it that way. And we go, God, I hope you die soon. I hope you die. So we can go ahead and make those changes. And it's really no different in science. In fact, we've all seen Oppenheimer, right? Or did you opt for the Barbie option? Okay, so we've all seen Oppenheimer. <clears throat> this is from Robert Kreese's American Scientist article. For Einstein, quantum mechanics was essentially a sideshow, although he was involved in the formulation of quantum mechanics also. Basically a sideshow that could be ignored in crafting a restoration of classical mechanics that Einstein held dearly. But for Oppenheimer, quantum theory embodied essential new insights about nature, even though he believed that the theory at some point would probably be superseded. This is what you saw in the movie portrayed really well, the clash between the two, the old guard and the new guard, right? Einstein was sure that classical mechanics was how fixes were going to operate. It's my paradigm, and I'm sticking to it. So when we have our paradigms, we have paradigm stasis. Why do we entrench those? Why does the concrete harden around our paradigms? Well, because of confirmation bias and the algorithms we see in social media that help reinforce that for us. So let's take a look here. What's confirmation bias? It's that tendency to seek out information that supports your paradigm or your position, causing a bias towards your position, right? You seek data that confirms that you're right. If you only seek out information that supports one idea, you're only going to find information that what? Supports your idea. And so what we see now, and you all know this, what pops up on your social media feeds is whatever. You know, if you search for a pair of red high heels, guess what all the ads are? Red high heels. If you search for conspiracy, that peanut butter is really made by aliens, guess what? All the articles you get. Peanut butter being made by aliens. And it's not true, by the way. You look, you look concerned about that. I just made that up, OK? So it happens in science here also. Some of you folks may remember way back in the ancient years of the 1980s, there were two American scientists by the names of Fleischmann and Pons who claimed that in their laboratory, in a powder blue Rubbermaid garbage can, they did cold fusion. And they believed it because they were so confident that what they were doing is right, their own confirmation bias made them see what wasn't happening. And nobody on the planet could replicate it. So we have to be aware of this human frailty. Let's take a look here quickly that misunderstanding the process and nature of science. A great resource here that I gave out. I gave out thousands of these to the K-12 science teachers, produced by the National Academy of Sciences. What are the definitions that we can agree on for what's a theory, what's a fact, what's a hypothesis, because it's all over the board. <laughs> so what's a scientific fact? A lot of people say, well, you know, your, science, your facts and science are the same as my fact. Well, no. It's an observation that has been repeatedly confirmed by the scientific method, not by anecdotal experience, but under controlled circumstances. The one that my wife said, make sure that you get in here tonight, was scientific theory. How many times have you heard, well, it's, it's just a theory, right? Because a theory in common colloquial everyday usage 
is a wild guess, right? It's just, well, I have a feeling that Amway stock is going to go up. We'll run with it, okay? Uh, that's just not how, that's not a scientific theory. The scientific theory is the fruit of science. All science exists for one reason, to predict outcomes under stated circumstances. Was anybody surprised in the scientific community when COVID mutated? And we go, my God, never saw that one coming. Evolutionary theory said you can count 100% that COVID's going to mutate. It predicts. And so a scientific theory is not some wild guess. It's a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that incorporates tested hypotheses, facts, and other, uh, other data. So it's not just we have a feeling. Okay, Confusing anecdotal experience with scientific empiricism. You say, well, I took ivermectin and it made me better. Well, the fact that you took ivermectin and it made you better, that's not a scientific experiment. Anecdotal evidence or experience is evidence from stories that people tell other stories. Well, you know, I had a splinter in my foot, so I put a mustard pack on it and the splinter disappeared. Well, probably not, okay? But that was my experience. Great, but that falls outside the purview of controlled experimentation. In science, it's data based upon empirical evidence produced from the results of the scientific method with controlled pro protocols, okay? So you say, well, wait a minute. Don't diss my anecdotal experience. I'm dissing your anecdotal experience, okay? Because 30 to 40% of patients enrolled in placebo studies claim benefit from taking the placebo. So when you see scientific data that says 40% of these people found evidence, you're not even out of the placebo range yet, right? It should be 50, 60, 70, 80%, because 30, 40, 30 to 40% of you in study after study after study after study reported in the National Institutes of Health, you will claim that you've had a benefit, even though it's a placebo. So when you say, my personal experience showed me this, it doesn't really mean much, unless it was a controlled experiment, okay? Influence of confusing correlation and causation as we wrap this up, okay? Okay, you know, are they the same? Say, well, again, I took ivermectin and I got better. I have a family member who, against informed advice, you know, don't take ivermectin. All the other members of the family took her to take ivermectin. And then they proudly called the next week to say she's still alive and it was the ivermectin. We don't even have time to investigate that particular claim, but we recognize there are a lot of other scientific reasons that she's still alive, including the drug she took ahead of time. So take a look here. Looking for relationships. A correlation is what? An apparent relationship between two or more variables, okay? What's causation? An established relationship between two or more variables. Let me give you an idea here. Let's take a look here. <clears throat> if we take a look at a correlation, we know, and that's not going to surprise anybody, this is from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, the probability of lung cancer increases as a direct effect of what? The number of cigarettes smoked per day. Can we show that empirically in controlled studies over and over and over again? Yes. We know there's a demonstrated relationship between smoking and your chance of cancer. That's causation. Let's take a look at correlation. Okay, so this here, fresh lemons imported into the United States from Mexico and traffic accidents in the United States. So over the, we look at here, we see the total number of highway deaths from 1996 has been steadily decreasing in the United States, while at the same time, we've been doing what with our lemon imports from Mexico? Increasing. Therefore, if you want to stay safe in your car, eat a lemon. Okay. Look at that, there's a perfect line correlation, but is it causation? No, right? It's an apparent association, but is there any association there? Of, of course there isn't, right? How about this one, okay? Correlation between countries' annual per capita chocolate consumption and the number of Nobel Prize laureates per 10 million population. The Swiss love their chocolate, and look at the number of Nobel Prize laureates they have based upon their population, right? Those, all those Nordic folks up there, they're just slamming down chocolate. And look at all of the Nobel Prize laureates they have. So if you want to get smarter, eat what? Yeah. I'll write you a note. Doctor's note if you need it. OK, get smarter, get a Nobel Prize. This is an apparent correlation. But is there any causation? Of course not. There's no causation there. 
How about this one? Autism rates in the United States from 1997 to 2008 shows the same increase with the consumption of organic foods in the United States. So who's to blame? Whole foods, okay? So it looks like, look at, the data's going together. They have to be related. No, they're not. They're correlated, there's an apparent association, but there's no cause and effect. You can take a million data lines and make them do that. Let's do one last one for you here. Bread consumption, health and behavior. Correlation versus causation. You be the judge. More than 98% of convicted felons are bread users. Right? Eat bread, go to prison, right? And that's a true statistic. Correlation or causation? Don't make me come to your house. Let's do this again. Correlation or causation? Correlation. Okay. In the 18th century, when virtually all bread was cooked in the home, the average life expectancy was less than 50 years. So cooking bread in a household shortens your life. Correlation or causation? Correlation. Okay. More than 90% of violent crimes are committed within 24 hours of consuming bread. Correlation or causation? Correlation. 50% of children who grew up in bread-eating households score below average on standardized achievement exams. That's true, but right, the data are what? Correlative, okay? Most American bread consumers are unable to distinguish between significant scientific facts and meaningless babble. <laughs> true fact, okay? So what does the future hold? Where do we go from here? This guy, you were with me last year. I, I, I was my most depressing talk I've, I've given to the group about you know, how we're all going to be dead because you know, the planet's dying, et cetera. So I'm going to try and give you a little upswing here, OK? Because I've been telling you about you know, the scientific literacy, the absolute literacy, the failure to understand science, et cetera. You think, well, it's not looking good for the United States. Well, I'll share a little quote from Socrates. Probably not from Socrates, but he gets credited with it anyway. Socrates said, the children now love luxury. They have bad manners. They have contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs, and tyrannize their teachers. In multiple Socratic writings, he feared for the future of the next society. And I think we all, as we get older, fear that Society's doomed at this point. You know, it's not going to look good. We might as well just go ahead and cash in our bonds and live hardy at this point because it's not looking good. But hopefully, right, we've managed since Socrates' time to overcome these barriers. I bring to you tonight the status of where we are in the United States. Can we continue at this continuous downward trend in literacy and reading? and increase in pseudoscientific beliefs? No, because we won't be successful. We are now in a more scientifically based society than at any time in human history. Science is more accessible to every person on the planet than it's ever been before. But yet, all the trends I've shared with you are not going up. They're what? They're going down. So let's see if we can figure something out. <laughs> OK? Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> if, by the way, before we act to the questions, if you want to dive, deeper dive, as I told you, I mean, we've just, this could have gone for hours and hours and hours more information. The two best books here to look on this is Michael Shermer's book, Why People Believe Weird Things, which was written in the 90s, and I'm sorry to say it, it hasn't gotten better. And then, of course, Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, basically about why is it that all civilizations have thought that there are demons and hauntings, etc. And then, if you want more, if you can't sleep tonight and you want to watch more Forbes videos, you can do a YouTube search here and just search Forbes under GRCC, and that'll take you to hours of putting you to sleep lectures from Forbes. Okay, there you go. Dr. Forbes, thank you for that lively lecture. I appreciate it. Any questions? I know I've got questions, but somebody else has got a question first. I know I did such a perfect job of answering every conceivable question you would have. No, I was just going to say, could you leave that last screen up so we could QR code it real quick? You betcha. That one? Okay. Excuse me, there, bud. He's bringing the microphone around so you can talk into the microphone. Yes, sir. 
Oh, he's when we're right behind you here, right behind. Hey, we know you won't forget your question. My name is Mike. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I appreciate the beginning, like you kind of grounded us in the scientific method, and then, and then you shared about um, some of the wild thinking. But I was curious about social science. You, you mentioned you were speaking to the hard science from what I understood, but I'm curious where that figures in and how we're surrounded in social science language is kind of baked into a lot of how we speak. And I, and I wonder if that's been kind of part of what's made us more comfortable using scientific language, but in a not so right context. If I understand your question, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you saying that some people think that social science is a soft science? I, I guess um, you, you didn't mention social science. And, I, and I'm curious what your opinion is about that and the validity, because there's a lot of debate about how actual measurable um, social or soft, uh, soft sciences um, are. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Uh, and if I don't answer your question, please let me know. But when we take a look at um, the sciences, the whole joke is, is that the only pure science is mathematics, right? Because there's never, never any exception to the rule. And then physics, right, which is based upon the pure science, right, becomes the next pure science, followed by chemistry, where we're still kind of, you know, we have some, some deviations from the rules. And then what a lot of people call the soft science of the classical sciences, which is biology, okay? Because I tell my, my students in class, here's the rule. It works all the time until we tell you differently in upper division, right? I call biology the science of exceptions. And that's what's so cool about biology. We say, here's how it works nine out of 10 times, but this critter does it this way, and it's really interesting. You get into the social sciences, which have come a long way in the last 20 years. Social science struggled more than two decades ago from, from approaching that more scientific method, because it was hard to get controls in many studies. But social sciences, I would not ever say that they're a soft science in any myth. They have more challenges. I mentioned that one of my degrees is in environmental science. You know, we, tend to, we always teach students that, that you have you know, the, the scientific method, and then you always have a control. You can't always have a control. In, in chemistry, sure. Physics, sure. Okay? But when you're dealing with ecological studies, how do you get the turtles on this side of the reef to keep doing what they're doing. And these are over here, and you can't. You can't always have controls. So people say, well, then in social sciences and in psychology, they struggle even more because the human is such a complex organism. We can't put you in a cage and feed you. So you get into area statistics called analysis of variance, multivariate analysis. And that's where statistics has saved a lot of psychology and social science because we have new fields of statistics that allow us to try and what's called normalize the data to take because you're not going to behave the way he behaves, the way he behaves, the way he behaves, even though you're living in the same town, have the same background. So how do we possibly account for all those variables? And it's a challenge. And the same challenge occurs in ecology. So did I answer your question? Did I go? I guess I'm curious how, I feel like we're saturated with a lot of information and there's a lot of conflict that happens between social sciences and I feel like it's very public and I wonder if that's influencing public opinion about trust in science at large. Ah, thank you, okay. So I think everybody heard his question. Well, absolutely, let's go back to the COVID years. I was telling my wife ahead of time that I now divide my life between what, pre-COVID and post-COVID, kind of like pre-Cambian and post-Cambian. Okay, so pre-COVID, so we see, look at, look at what Fauci put up with during COVID. Right? As we saw, and this is, I didn't include this tonight, it's in my editorial cuts at the end of the PowerPoint, on uh, public's trust in scientists plummeted during COVID and beyond. And that's a, a hole we need to get out of because there's so much disinformation out that you're respect to. How do we then, and this is kind of the genesis of the talk, is how do we get the cons science consuming public to understand what's nonsense, what's pseudoscience, and what's valid scientific debate? Right? Because that's what it's about. Science is about debating. And people say, well, no, you scientists always agree with each other. Oh, no, no, no. Careers aren't made by agreement. S careers in science are made by taking the other person off the pedestal and showing them that you have the true data. So it's a dog-eat-dog -dog human endeavor. So we have to let people understand that that's what science is still about, but there's so much noise out there in the media that we just don't have people understanding how to determine what's science and what is intellectual scientific debate and what's just nonsense. Teacher's voice. You saw that there's an increase in non-belief when we landing on the moon. 
with mm-hmm. the millennials. Yeah. Could p- most of that be because of education and the lack of exposure to the space uh, space program? Sure, it, it's, it's all about education. And that, that's the point of my talk is that, are we doing a good job as science educators? What we see, he has a question back here, is that the joke in, in college and university, if our students come unprepared, as I've demonstrated for you tonight and all the data, it's clearly not our fault, it's the high school teacher's fault. And in high school, they blame the middle school teachers. And the middle school teachers blame the elementary school teachers, which blame the kindergarten, which say, this has to be the parents, okay? But the reality is, is that we just don't have, you know, the attainment that we need to in knowledge of the sciences in order to understand what's, there's so much information out there right now, they just don't have the background in order to wrap their arms around that. And it's our fault as science educators. Now, I've done my best over my career. Okay, I'd like to think that all my students, you know, are gonna go out there and understand everything. But the reality is, uh, we just don't see that. And I mentioned to you here, I showed you some of that data from the graduate school students who are going into teaching. I have had the, the pleasure of teaching literally thousands and thousands and thousands of K-12 teachers here in Michigan, high school teachers and middle school teachers on teaching nature of science. And I have been concerned many times on their lack of basic understanding of the curriculum that they're teaching. And we talk about the nature of science, that's not the scientific method, it's that what are the limitations of science, right? Like, can you test for a god? No, scientists can't do that. It's far flat, that's the purview. And so we have an underprepared population to A, teach science, and B, be able to determine what is true and what is not. And you know, when I'm elected king, I have some ideas on how we solve that. But at this point, we have some challenges. There was another question back there? Yes. So in terms of correlation in what's going on, if the society is basically motivated by money, and are we lacking uh, reinforcing people that put forth the effort that is required in the sciences uh, versus in social sciences, uh, are we reinforcing with financial reward enough um, science teachers, math teachers, make the same as gym teachers, okay? And the, so therefore, th- those people uh, or the people that get engineering degrees and make the products. It's the managers that make the big money. It's the people in finance that make the big right. money. Right. The people that actually produce and have the technological, uh, they make a good living, but they don't achieve the kind of financial, unless, of course, you're Bill, well, even Bill Gates, he's more of a manager. So that's that's my question: is that is the finance is part of the problem? Our society does not reward the kind of effort that goes into more technical scientific pursuits. Short answer: yes, but we never give short answers to professors. So when we take a look at why are we seeing possibly one reason for these appalling success rates in science? Because if you have no interest in science. If you see no value in a high paying career, a prestigious position, are you going to care about it when you're in the class? Probably not. And so we see right now here in Michigan and Ashley, we have a a dearth of of K-12 teachers, right? People are leaving. The average teaching longevity on the United States is five years, okay, before they leave the field, okay? You're just getting your feet wet. And so in, in colleges and universities, we're seeing pay rates decreasing in relation to the mean rates in the United States. Uh, We have, and that's also true in research, we have here in Grand Rapids some of the best research scientific laboratories in the nation, Van Andel Institute, the MSU Research Center, the list goes on and on. These are people who are literally discovering the cure for cancer. And we have research scientists with PhDs and postdocs, luckily, teaching for us here on campus to pay the bills. They teach adjunct for us here, and we're lucky to have them. But if you can throw a baseball, if you can hit a ball, if you can kick a ball, then who makes the most money on every university in the United States? Professors, presidents, or the coaches? Coaches. Coaches make more than the University of Michigan president, the MSU president, et cetera. So. Hi, 
Hi, I know you said earlier you had some kind of maybe an idea of how we can kind of derail this downward, you know, what we're going with with education. What do you suggest as a parent or a teacher we can start doing to kind of prevent that situation? Yeah, the, so the early introduction into the sciences, you know, not necessarily on the track of we're going to make you a scientist, right? But I had two pictures up here of DeGrasse Tyson. Kids love him, okay? And when you have people that the children can identify as, and again, this is true, we see if some, somebody up there that looks like me, right, that I could be that person or I could follow that. Having the role models and having the quality science education where the kids get geeked, because most all of you in here are parents. You know that kids, when they're three, four, or five, you know, before they get to the double digits, they're sponges, right? They want to know everything. And so if we can get them hooked into science, not necessarily become scientists, but consumers of science, right? And that's my job. Most of what, you know, I teach a lot of, well, not in anatomy and physiology, my other classes, that's what I tell my general biology teachers, that teach rather, not mine, but those who teach in our department, your biology 101 students are not going to go out and be scientists. That's just not that demographic, usually. But 100% of them are going to be consumers of science. And that's where we need to put our efforts in. And so that's where we come as parents. Let's get you geeked about science early. Yes, sir. So I had a question about, you talked, you gave a good explanation of the, the way that the literacy levels, the scientific understanding, the preparation that students have is going down. I didn't hear a lot of why that's going down. And I have my theories. <laughs> you know, you talk about partisanship, putting dipshits like Betsy DeVos in charge of the you know, Department of Education, things that sort of lead into students not being able to be prepared. Are, do you have ideas about this? You just didn't put them into this topic because it's only an hour? Or does that get into a realm that you're not comfortable with because it's a le little less scientific and more in like political science type stuff? Well, we'd probably th throw that into the social scientists, right, to spend more time on that rather than, you know, someone like myself. But being very familiar with the literature, we're seeing that we're just seeing that, you know, as we see the high school GPA average in the United States has increased over the last decade, but that performance has decreased. So what's going on here? Are they suddenly having a brain freeze when they sit for the ACT? Or are we teaching them less, telling them they've achieved more, and then asking them to do well in college? So we're seeing that a lot of, and again, this is anecdotal in this point, is that we have seen that from, we've seen in anecdotal reports that the, the benchmark for achievement in science in a lot of our K-12 and colleges is decreasing to get by. And I, I can't share any data from our campus because we're doing this research right now and it hasn't been shared. But, you know, there's a big concern across the United States for what's happened post-COVID. Would it be shocking to you to know that there's been on average about a 10% decrease in performance by college students after COVID? Nobody's shocked in here, okay? So that is a very real social influence because sitting in our college university classes is the COVID high school crowd right now. And so we understand why we might have a dip there, but from the data I showed you, it's not a big dip, right? I mean, it was already low and then there was a little divot and then we're back up to low again. So it's a big, it's a systemic thing. It's kind of like saying, how do we save the planet? You know, it's four beers and a long conversation and, and then trying to get the political uh, will to do that. And I just don't think that we have currently the political will to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think most of the data that you showed was pertinent to the U.S. and their decline in, mm -hmm. I guess, understanding science. And I wondered, are there any, I, I believe you said also this is a worldwide trend. Yeah. Are there any countries that are kind of bucking the trend or doing the least poorly this way that we should? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with the data from all the different countries. The study I showed you about the, the uh, student teachers, the graduate student teachers, that was from Spain. That was University of Valencia. So it was just as Pauline as ours. And so I think that Spain might be a good representation of, of Western Europe. I think we have one time for maybe one can more I, question. Can I ask or a question too? There's a public policy debate that, that's going on regularly between uh, politicians that want to improve literacy, whether it be scientific or otherwise, and uh, to do that, they are uh, trying to uh, regulate in some way social media. And then there's the other side that says social media uh, is all about free speech, and we don't 
want to do any kind of regulation at all. We want to anybody say whatever they want. What's your take on navigating that? Well, I, I don't know if that's a, a question for a biologist. That's probably more of a sociologist question there. Uh, because it, we know, as we talked about here just briefly, with the paradigm stasis, it's my paradigm and I'm sticking to it. However, the algorithms that we see in social media are going to feed upon that and give you those articles. So maybe making students, population, social media, let's coin the same term, literate, understand how you're fed these stories. Understand why they're coming to your email box. Even when you do a Google search, you think you're getting access to the whole, no, that's an algorithm also. So as long as consumers of information understand that I'm not getting an unbiased literature search here, that would be of value, yeah, quite a bit. When my students do research, we use, it's called um, Google Scholar, if you don't know about it. Google Scholar, it's one of those 5,000 little apps that they own there. Google Scholar only searches from refereed scientific journals. That's one way to go. Final question? Last one. Um, to address the, uh, the, the questioner's question about what to do about it, how to, how to fix it, um, I would argue that everyone's most valuable asset is their time. And so how children and students use their time, and as parents, how you guide that use, um, that's probably how to best fix it. All right, thank you. Thank you for all of your questions, and thank you for spending your evening with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Forbes. Thanks a lot for coming. April 17th is the next lecture on the minds of animals right here. See you then. Thanks. <laughs>